Okay, good morning boys and girls. Um, today we've got an interesting video. I don't know much about it, but it's the BK Precision 470 picture tube tester rejuvenator for CRTs. This is one of the mid-range models, as I understand it. I think it goes from 46 something right up to the 465, the 470, the 480, and I believe a 490 that was different. So this is sort of middle era. Now I thought these came out in the mid to late 70s, but looking at the manuals in this one, they're dated somewhere between 82 and 85 and 86. So it's a little bit later than I thought it was going to be, which is good, you know, newer is better, I guess. And I believe this has got some features which are better than the earlier ones. So we'll get into that as I learn how to use it. But for now, I'm just going to show you what I've bought what's in the box and then we'll we'll get to how it works I guess one day. So for those that don't know what this is, this is a CRT tester and rejuvenator and what it can do is it can give a little bit extra life to a CRT that's dying or the primary use for me is going to be the testing feature to see well how much life does the tube have, is the tube okay, uh, is the tube dead so I've got some arcade machines with some quote-unquote dead screens in them, or, or, or the screen doesn't turn on. And I need to understand, is it the chassis or is it the tube? Because in this day and age, 2022, trying to find replacement tubes is getting hard. So you want to know, am I wasting my time? I've got some CRT TVs that I need to repair. And again, am I going to spend £100, £200 recapping boards and replacing chips and all of that sort of stuff? only to find that the tube was dead anyway. So this to me was an essential purchase. I've been looking for a little while. This one cost me just over £120. Um, I was happy with the purchase. It seems relatively complete, so let's get into it. So looking at the box, it's a hard plastic. I know this one was kind of accused of being a bit rubbish because it's a plastic hinge rather than a metal hinge which is unfortunate but this one seems to be in good condition the overall box seems to be in really good condition there's a slight uh, dent on the corner there but other than that it's you know it's, it's dusty it could do with a damn good clean but the handle's intact it has four uh, little rubberized feet on the bottom with four crosshead screws and we need to take that apart when it comes to cleaning and servicing the device so it's got a plastic clip on the front and then inside one of the main reasons I was interested in this device actually or in this particular one was most of the paperwork is complete so I'll just try and bring this in shot a little bit uh, but hopefully you can see that all the paperwork is there so we'll, we'll reposition the camera and we'll, we'll have a look at that in a moment um, I've noticed there's a bit of plastic there that's chipped from something. It's not ideal. <laughs> um, but if we have a look at the tester itself, this is a bit different than some of the earlier ones that have got three separate gauges. This one is integrated all into one gauge. Um, and I'll bring you in closer now. Okay, so just before we get to the tester, I just wanted to go through the paperwork. As you can see, this is relatively complete. So we've got, um, this is quite quite nice, we've got a CRT setup chart subscription offer. So basically here, when you buy this, you would get one of these books. And this book shows you all of the different requirements for the different tubes. So you've got, it's, it's quite a clever book how it's designed. You've got your colour tubes here, you've got your black and white tubes here, and then the book is shorter on the back again. And you've got condensed instructions there. So I think, I'm trying to remember now, yeah, gives you a, a couple of notes about what the book's about and, and some sort of generalized things. And this is quite interesting. This is something I'll pick up on later when we go to look at this in more depth. How you work out from the book what tube you want. And all of these documents I'm going to sort of scan and upload so you'll be able to read these properly, but that's quite handy. Once you get into the book, You've got what tube you're testing, what to set the heater voltage to, which adapter to use, and you can just go through it like that. And that's the same principle with the 
black and white tubes. And then at the back you've got some condensed instructions and this, a lot of these books you'll see they cover two models, the 467 and the 470. So you've got condensed instructions for the 467 and then I think, is there another one? Yeah. Condensed instructions for the 470, which is obviously what I've got. So we'll look at that a bit closer when we get to it. So this book would have come out with the device. This one hasn't got a date on it. Um, but you can imagine this was the original book for the device. So what happens when a new tube comes out that you're not aware of? You could subscribe. So you could pay for one year, two years, three years, and um, give them the money, sign it and date it, tell them where you live, and uh, they would send you a new one of these, I suppose, every year or maybe every so many months, however they often they issue it. So that's quite nice to see. Um, then moving on, this is something that's quite important. Um, the schematics and the parts list. So it's good to see that there isn't a huge amount of capacitors in this. There's three, C1, C2, C3. And handily it tells you most of the information, but we'll have a look at that when we take it apart. And I will be purchasing and replacing those. It's also got a full schematic diagram of the layout of the machine and how it functions. And then again, you've got some miscellaneous things like if the case broke you can get the case assembly you can get some power cables fuses etc and there you go that you can see this one is 1984 so that's really nice to see because I can imagine that would be quite hard to come by um, you've also got a registration card so if you wanted to get extended warranty I suppose or let them know that you were the one who bought it so they can send you marketing information you could register and if you were in the US you could get that free posted. Uh, we've got a servicing centre flyer which is quite nice and again this is weird this one is dated 85 uh, and that one was dated 84 so it's around that era. And you can see where you would have been able to get this serviced at the time. Then we have the main manual uh, but before we get to that we also have, because I imagine somebody's bought an, an additional adapter at some point, we have the data sheet for the CR21 adapter. And I imagine this came in a little box or something, hence the folding. And it's really nice to see what the pinout of the adapter is, what the general layer of the adapter, the adapter is called adapter 21, which is kind of how being BK do that. It shows you what all the different pin tolerances are and what wire colour they should be. And uh, some tubes that it's been tested with. So that's nice to see as well. And I'd be interested to know if anybody has this data sheet for some of the other adapters. Because I can imagine this would be quite useful information for, for people that have these devices and want to use them. So that's that. And then finally we've got the, the main manual. Now I've looked online and I found that somebody has uploaded a an older, well, a okay quality scan of one of these manuals. It's all black and white, but then of course the manual is black and white. Um, but it, it's dated 86 and this one's dated 82. So that's quite interesting. And I noticed that they must have been bought out at some time because it's no longer Dynascan, it's, it's something else. So... Yeah, so I had a read through this last night. I picked this up yesterday. And um, it's quite interesting. There's some interesting <laughs> phrases in here. It, it says, you know, you could do the full rejuvenation on a tube. And you can even up the, the heater voltage somewhat. And it says, don't worry about it too much because the tube's probably useless anyway. So just go for it. So it's quite interesting language. Um, so once you get through all the paperwork... Then under here you've got a little piece, piece of velcro, and this is going to all fall out, so I'll just try and do that. And you can see we have the neck adapters, and we'll just have a quick look at these in a second. So looking at the manual, it says that, uh, I believe it says it, it came with six adapters from the factory. Um, 
Yeah. So it says accessories, CRT socket adapters, six are supplied. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So somebody must have bought one. So I assume that one of these, what did we say the CR21 was? It was um, adapter 21. So I imagine one of these, yeah, there we go, 21. So that would have been the optional one that was purchased. And then these must be the six original. So that's nice. I think this is in really good condition for its age. So this is the the optional adapter that was purchased. So this will be the CR21. You can see here kind of what these look like. And this goes into the harness of the device, which we'll look at in a moment. And then it would just go on the neck of the tube. We've got this one. Is this the one I think it is? Hmm, maybe, maybe not. I think it is. Yeah. Mm. Mm. This is the 23 adapter. Now maybe that means CR23. I don't know. I'll find out more as I learn. Here's a simpler one. The number 3 adapter. And some of these are for black and white tubes. And I'm actually going to use a black and white TV uh, to test this. And so I'm hoping that one of these adapters will do the job. That's adapter number five. And these all still look in really good condition, to be fair. And we've got adapter number 24. This is an interesting neck adapter. It's very different to the other ones. You can see the other ones, it slides over pins. And this one seems to slide around them. So it, the neck must have like um, metal on the outside of it. And I think I have seen people use this type in other videos, so it must be somewhat common. Then we've got the adapter number 25. Now quite why, why it has to be so big, I don't know. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, but that's that one there. Mm. Looks like it's got some glue on it, whether that's been repaired at some point, I don't know. And then finally, oh, this one's obviously not been out in a long time. <laughs> Uh, adapter number 15, somewhat similar with that other one. So, yeah, there we go. So looking a bit more closer at the device now, we can see that we've got a standard UK plug. Now again, due to the age I've mentioned this in some of my other videos, this plug doesn't have protected collars on it. Okay, so hopefully this is in shot. So I'm just going to move this one here, and you'll see this one moves really easily. And just listen, it's very quiet. And then this one, on the other hand, doesn't do that. So that is kind of ridiculous. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm going to... The other ones all, all seem fine, to be honest with you. It's only the heater voltage that's doing that. So I'm, uh, I'm going to clean that before we go too much further. And of course there's a nice layer of dust on this because I guess it hasn't been used in a while. I'm also going to attempt to calibrate it because it, it mentions in the manual how to calibrate it. So we'll get to that. So as I said, just before we get into the, the meat of it, we can see we've got two labels in here. I'm imagining one is a serial number, which is probably the little blue one there. And this one is obviously explaining what it is. It mentions it is a model 470. It's showing dual voltage. Now whether that means it supports both voltages by default I don't know um, but you've got like one I think that says 117 234 50 60 hertz 40 watts down in Scancorp Chicago uh, Illinois so that's all there is to really show you up here so the next stage for me is to probably disassemble it so we'll get to that next okay so I've just got the tester flip over on its back now and um, to remove it you've got four screws so we'll just undo those they look to be just standard Phillips screws I believe yeah and this one's a little bit loose anyway so. Okay, 
just once you've removed the screws, carefully uh, turn it back over. And um, what we should now be able to do is just lift, lift the, yeah, lift the design out. So there's quite a bit of weight to it. It's got a transformer on board, so just try and move the case out of the way slightly. And looking in the case, you know, it's a little, a little bit dusty, but overall in good condition. So I'm going to give all that a clean when I get to it. And then to to look at the the actual tester itself again we'll turn that over and we can see we've got the fuse in place got the transformer now another youtuber had one of these and it was damaged in transit and the transformer actually very closely smashed nearly smashed into this switch but we can see this one there's a nice bit of clearance between it um, now the, yeah, the, the scratchy pot is this one here, so I'll attempt to see what I can do with that. I'm not too sure if the base can be removed on it, but we'll, we'll have a look. Um, yeah, the capacitors, you can see the three capacitors here, so in order to replace them we would have to probably remove this board, which I imagine is just the, the two posts there. And uh, I believe that's probably the adjustment pot for the calibration of the device, but we'll we'll get into that a bit more. So I'll give you in a second. Okay, with the tester on the bench now, hopefully you can see the the layer of dust that's sat on it. So I'm going to try and fully clean this. So it looks like um, the knobs just pull off. So they just sort of pull up and off. So I'm just going to do that with all of them. And they've just got little um, metal retainer clips in them. Because I just want to be able to get uh, behind them and make sure everything's clean. I'm guessing these haven't been off in a little while. So. actually going to try and do is I'm going to try and see if I can unbolt this one and uh, put it away from the board to to clean it so we'll see how that goes in a second okay so I've got the potentiometer out now and I've just gently pulled it away from the board so it's clearer to the camera I was hoping to get in the back of it I think you probably can take the back off but I don't want to chance it because I'm not familiar with the design but I don't know if you'll be able to hear it we'll just do it again and see if you can hear the scratchiness Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a bit of this stuff, uh, deoxid fader. I do swear by this stuff; it's it's absolutely brilliant. So we'll just um, we'll squirt a little bit in the opening. Uh, we'll just give that a go. It already feels better. It doesn't sound better, but it feels better. So I'll just move it all the way to zero. Just try that again. Move it all the way to the sort of end of limits. Yeah, it definitely feels better, but it doesn't sound as great as I was hoping. So, 
you know, maybe in, in, sometime in the future this will need to be replaced. But thankfully having that schematic will allow me to uh, to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to use this theory to uh, just clean up and add a bit of fader lubricant to all of the pots to give it the best chance it's got. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and of course clean the faceplate and come back to you. So I'm just cleaning through the tester and I've just taken the back of the plug off. And for anybody in the UK watching, this is not how you wire a plug. The, there's a bit of copper hanging out. I mean, it's not essential, but it's not ideal. But the, the key takeaway is, is look at how long the, uh, the brown, the live cable is. The whole design with the UK plug is that the longest wire is the earth, then the neutral, and then the shortest wire is the live. So if somehow somebody pulled the cable out of the plug, the live will disconnect whilst the neutral and the earth is still connected. And then obviously the earth disconnects last if you pulled it hard enough. It looks to me like the live is the same length as the neutral and it's been wrapped up around here and, and buckled and what have you. That's not good because you could pull this and potentially you could disconnect the neutral of the earth and leave the live connected and um, in some sort of fault condition you could end up electrocuting yourself quite badly. So when I rewire this I'll do them to the right lengths and you'll see what I mean. Okay so yeah no no trick photography involved here. Um, <laughs> the earth is actually the shortest of the three cables which is just bizarre. So in a fault situation potentially the earth could have disconnected first then the live then the neutral. Uh, not ideal not something I'd want to be using, so uh, we'll sort that out. <laughs> Just a quick one before I do it, I thought we might have some uh, fake news crowd out there. So this is a brand new plug, just got this out of the bag, and you can see it's got a cardboard protector on it, which you should always take off. But what you'll notice if you've ever looked at them, which you probably haven't, I know I didn't before I found this out, is it actually shows you on it the measurements of the cables. And for those that didn't believe me, you've got 12 mil on the live, 22 on the neutral, and 32 on the earth. So that's what it should be, and that's what I'm going to do when I'm going to actually fit this plug. Because uh, it's white like the original, so it's got the, the newer standard. Um, again, so the old plug is British standards, so you've got uh, British standard 1363. And then on the new plug, it should say, yeah, it says... Uh, British Standard 1363-A, which was for the amendment. Um, so, yeah, and the amendment was the adding the collars. So I'll go ahead and cut these cables to the right lengths. And uh, I'll put some ferrules on it as well, which I've shown in another video. It's just these little uh, metal ferrules, and you can crimp them on. And it just means that when you screw it into the plug, you're going to get good grip on the cable rather than potentially pinch just a few strands so it's safer so that's what i like to do okay so um i've cut the hopefully that focuses i don't know if it's focusing or not to be honest the um i've cut the cables uh, and as you can see the live is clearly shorter than the rest so that should mean that it will pull out first so they're not the exact length I need I think they're a tiny bit long but you can see where I'm going with this and uh, they've been ferrelled so they're a lot, a lot safer so I'll get these in the plug and show you that. Okay so here we go so that's the plug rewired um, so hopefully you can see now the live is clearly shorter there's nice flowing bends on the cables I mean a slight kink on the live but nothing to hugely worry about it's not going to pull out because cable grips nice and tight and you can see that more importantly there's no live conductor showing so because i've used the ferrules because i've done it sort of neatly there's no conductor showing so it just means it's a little bit safer and at least i know that this device is is gonna be okay in my hands okay so here we are um i've cleaned up all the case now given it a good clean you see there's now no dust to be seen some scratches and what have you but otherwise the case is cleaned up really well um it's, it's all nice and clean on, on all sides. Um, so if we have a little look inside now. Oh, didn't want that to happen. That's annoying. Um, 
you can see the the actual tester is now much cleaner I've taken all the knobs off cleaned it obviously taken it out had a look at the back this one's still quite scratchy so I think it could be at the end so we'll, we'll see but that all feels fine now um, this knob the bit of plastic that broke off actually came out the back of this so just need to be a bit careful with it because the, the plastic is cracking now so what I might do is I might put some epoxy in the knobs just to stop the plastic from expanding more um, spare adapter there the new plug obviously fitted so that's all nice I've cleaned all the cabling um, what some of you may have noticed if you've seen one of these before so when it actually came to opening the lid um, the testers were or the, the neckboard adapters were around the wrong way so rather than being there that's where the paperwork should go they should obviously be there and I noticed that from watching somebody else's video so turned that round glued that bit of foam back in on that side so that's all okay so yeah I think the only thing I wanted to do was I wanted to um, I wanted to measure the capacitors before I put it back together which I forgot to do but other than that I'm happy with the results of cleaning it so I now need to plug it in I don't know if it works but we'll, we'll find out in a second okay so I've plugged it in and I have just quickly tried it and it does seem to get power so if we have all the knobs set to uh, nothing it's obviously on power off mode at the moment if we go to set heater we are getting a power light so that, that seems good and then if I jump it up to the 4 to 7 volts which seems to be where most are um, you see the gauge go up and then if I adjust the heater range you see the dial go up so 6.3 I believe is some of the, the more common ones so that seems to work and I've gone gone through all the different settings on that and it does seem to go the interesting thing is is when I go up to 12 to 14 that's on minimum if I turn it on it's well over the 12 point something gauge so God knows what that's doing <laughs> uh, so yeah interesting stuff so looking at the cable itself I didn't realize this at first but it is actually keyed which is really nice so you've got a cut off on the corners so and you've got like a little ridge on that side as well so there's only one way of putting it in so it goes in that way and then if I try to turn it round it doesn't go in so at least you know that they're directional you can't possibly get it wrong so that's quite nice so the next thing is to actually see how accurate this is so I'm going to have to see if I can find um, some cable or something to go in this because I don't have my, my better multimeter unfortunately. Um, so I'll find something to go in the pins and then we'll see what the voltage output is. Okay so I've just had a quick look at the manual here and it says field calibration. Connect an AC voltmeter to pins 1 and 14 of adapter number 3. So I've plugged in adapter number 3 and I've identified pins 1 and 14 it says set the heater voltage to 4 to 7 which I have and basically turn it on see what you get get it to 6.3 volts check it and adjust that potentiometer on the underside on the PCB so obviously I'm not going to do that right now but what I will try and do is I'm just going to I don't have a multimeter at the moment that's good enough so I'm going to use this uh, AC dead tester it does seem to do DC just about uh, and if we look at pins 1 and 14 so it's that one I'm just going to sit down to do this actually bear with me uh, that one and the, that one I think yeah there we go and if I just turn the dial so it's saying it's reading about 6 or 7 volts which if I just look over yeah is it 6.3 so if I go up a little bit that's saying 8 volts, so it's maxing out at 8 volts. If I bring it down, that's 7, that's 6, that's 5. So that's 5 there. That's 6 volts there. 
so 6.3 is probably about right um, so yeah it seems to be working um, like I say I wish I had my better multimeter with me but I just don't have it don't know where it's gone um, so yeah I'm happy to say that it seems to be working so it's on to the next test okay so now we need a test subject so I've been into the storage and dug out this little monster uh, this is a black and white TV that a friend donated to me years ago. I don't know, five years or such ago. As you can see, it's absolutely filthy. Um, it was pretty much like how I got it. It's a Pi Rambler 12. It's a little black and white TV. Um, so what we're going to do is we'll have a little look at it and take the back off and see what kind of neck board is on this and see if we can see how good the tube is. Okay. It's the next day. Um, I thought I was just going to take the, the cover off last night and then I realised that if I tried to use this style screwdriver it wouldn't work because of the body of the screwdriver. Then I thought maybe maybe this one won't work. Won't work. So I had to go down to the industrial unit and dig out uh, these two monsters which were bought for similar reasons. Um, in another life I used to collect classic cars and stuff, so sometimes you needed long screwdrivers. So this one is plenty long enough to do the job it would seem, I hope. Um, yeah. So... Hopefully that's loose enough there. We'll just try the other side. Mm. Unless that one's not the right size. Let's try this one. Yeah, there it is. Um, when you're dealing with old electronics and stuff or old plastics, you want to be a bit careful. Make sure that you don't try and undo it super fast because you may crack it. Um, I'll just put a cloth under the tube. Luckily the bottom ones I can just use um, a normal size screwdriver on. And this is kind of an interesting TV. It's got um, AC and DC options. It would have had some sort of aerial on the top that's been snapped off. It's fine, got an external aerial. You can see some part numbers and stuff, but we'll have a look at that in a minute. So let's see how you get this off. Because I am not 100% sure. than I wanted but right. Ah, interesting. Okay, so that area is sort of self contained in the the lid. So just looking at the model numbers on the back of this thing, so it says type 31BX 1016-05X, 240V, 50Hz, 27 watts, 
12 volts, 15 watts, made in Singapore, SV00 WK309, SV3463. Um, let's just see if I can put that in front of the camera. Hopefully you can see those labels. Um, so, let's have a look, see what we've got. So we've got a little black and white tube. Um, little speaker there. Now let's see. I don't want to... I had this plugged in the other day, so I don't want to unnecessarily touch things. Oh, that I don't want to touch. Let's see what this is saying. So this is saying... Okay, this matches. Interesting. So, 3-1... Let's see if I can get that in there. 31 BX1016 must be must be the tube, so that's quite cool. In some way perhaps. Although actually now I tell a lie. The tube is or the tube number is on the other side. I don't know if you can see that. I'm just trying to. So it's right in the back there. Let's have a look. It says 12 VC UP4 is the tube type. So yeah, I imagine it's a, a 12 inch tube. Looking at the board, lots of different capacitors, a couple of fuses, little baby flyback. Uh, oh, there is a an integrated chip. So, yeah. So what we'll do is we'll have a look, look that tube up, and see what the the next step is. Okay, so that didn't really work. Um, I don't have the, the right neck board adapter. So when we bought this house, this heap of crap was found in the loft. Um, it's a Sanyo, a little portable Sanyo, Sanyo uh, colour TV, I believe. So we might be more lucky with this, maybe, I don't know. So let's have a look, see what we've got here. So you've got similar sort of built-in aerial thing. I've plugged this in, it doesn't work at all. So it'll be interesting to see what the deal is with this. So, we've got, what have we got here? Get some light, mate. How they designed these TVs? I don't know how they ended up using such recessed screws, it's a bit ridiculous. So this was sat in the loft of this house um, when we bought it and uh, I just flung it over my industrial unit out the way uh, just thinking that one day maybe I'll do something with it today might be that day who knows um, so there's two screws on the top there must be yeah. there's two screws on the uh, bottom You never know, this might have a good tube, it might just be a dead chassis or something. So it might be useful for something, I don't know. There we go, why not? Hopefully that's enough. Let's see. Um. <sighs> Come back in. So, 
seems to Of course, the board could be on this in some way, I don't know. I'm not actually I'm not concerned. <sighs> All right. Bloody hell. Right, there we go. So that's that off. It's a lot of dust. So, what have we got on this? We've got a tube, which is A34EACOOX, colour screen. Um, wow, that's pretty, uh, pretty manky. I don't know if it's got, oh, it's got an internal fuse. It could have been, could be one of many things, I suppose, that killed this, but um, let's see if we've got something for this tube. Okay, so there's a recurring theme here. That was another waste of time, another netboard I don't have. So here's another TV. It's a little JVC I bought on um, Facebook Marketplace last year. Quite a nice little TV, composite only, but got a nice picture on it at least. So I know the tube's good at least. So let's see what kind of neck adapter this one needs um oh it actually has reasonable screws amazing so. okay before i go too much further i've actually seen the model number it's on the side of the tube I'll just see if i can just bring you in to show you that there it is so there you go look that up Okay, so I've just gone through one black and white tube, one colour tube, the JVC tube, and now we're on to this B&O Beer Centre 1. This was a, a sort of a last ditch attempt. I've got more TVs, but I'm getting fed up taking TVs apart. There's a level of irony here that this TV I bought on the same day, Friday, uh, as I bought the CRT tester. They were actually a mile apart. So I picked this up for uh, £10 from Facebook Marketplace. The guy told me that it just wouldn't turn on anymore. No idea why. Um, thought it might have been the remote. And it was just sort of sold as is. So I offered to buy it because I collect b and TVs. And I was hoping to potentially get this tester to work out if the tube was good or not. To see if it was worth repairing. And uh, here we are. So you can see that the tester is connected to the neck of the tube. I have discharged the tube and removed the anode cap just for uh, safety reasons. You can see the anode cap hanging down. It's obviously unplugged. So I'll bring you in closer to the tester and we'll see what it does. Okay, so I'm going to um, have a look at this. I've got the manual here with me, so I'm just flicking through it. So, uh, operation page eight, okay. So set the function switch to off, which it is. Uh, plug it in, which it is. Set all the variables counterclockwise, which, uh, let's put it on gun red. Yeah, which they are. Um, set the heater voltage range, so we've got 0.4, or sorry, 0 to 4, and then 4 to 7. So that's where we need to be, because we need 6.3 on the voltage. So it says, set the heater range switch. If the CRT to be tested is mounted in the TV, make sure that the power to the TV is removed, which it is, preferably by unplugging the set, which it is. And then I have read online that it's good practice to discharge and remove the anode cup, which is what I've done. Um... And then connect the socket adapter to the base of the CRT, which I have done. Uh, make sure that you align the key, which I have done. Uh, rotate to set heater. So we'll go up one. And you can see the power has come on, which is good. Um, and you can see 
that we've jumped to four volts, which is the lowest point of the range that we're on. So it now says, um, carefully adjust the set heater control whilst uh, observing the heater voltage scale of the meter and make sure that it matches the setup chart. So as I say, it says 6.3 volts. So here we've got the set heater and you can see that the, the way it's designed is the pointer goes to the relevant controls. So we'll dial this up somewhat. Um, comes up quite a long way. We'll bring it up to hopefully 6.3. I'm trying to see over the camera. That looks to be about right. Now, in an ideal world, I would put the multimeter on that to make sure that is bang on, but I can't find the damn thing. So we'll have to trust this for now. I think it could be a little bit under, but, but we'll see. Um, so set the heater voltage, and then you need to do some leakage tests. So it says, rotate the function switch to the heater leakage. Now it says, uh, leakage between heater and cathode is okay if the reading on the meter is within the yellow area of the bottom scale marked leakage. Um, yeah, okay, so you've got the scale here, look, and you can see we're reading basically zero. And it says, um, for colour tubes only, rotate the gun selector to the other two guns. So we can see this is reading okay, because it's on zero. Next gun, zero. Oh, actually, I may not have gone all the way. So it's red, green, blue. And we can see it's reading zero on all three guns, which is good. And then it says, look for G1 leakage. So we'll move to G1 leakage. And again, repeat through the guns. So we can see we're in the okay range, we're on zero. Okay again. Okay again. So that looks good. So once you've done your leakage tests, uh, then you move on to setting the G1 voltage. Now it's presumed that things are 50 volts unless otherwise stated. And I couldn't find the exact information for this tube online, but I found one very similar and it did say it was 50 volts. So I'm happy with that. So we'll move to set G1 voltage. And then you just want to bring this one up to uh, 50 volts on the G1. So you've got the G1 scale and you can see 50 volts is somewhat towards the middle. I think that's about, yeah, that looks about 50 volts. Uh, so once you've set the G1, you then need to set the cutoff. Very important, make sure they're all down. So we'll move towards the cutoffs now. Make sure which gun you're on, so I am on red. And then we'll bring red up slightly. And it says uh, to set the cutoffs, the meter should read zero or slightly above zero, which it was reading, well, it's reading zero. Slowly advance each of the three G2 controls clockwise until the meter rises one division. And you can see it says here, set the cutoff at one div. So what we'll do, and I have tested this off camera, is we'll bring it up. You want to do it very slowly, but for me, it's going to be around here somewhere. Let me just get over the, the dial. So you don't want to overdo it. So it's starting to move, I think. Yeah, there you go, it's starting to move. So I can't quite see. So I think that's... I think that's one division. Again, we'll do the blue. I'm just going to move the camera, bring it in closer for you, and uh, check that myself. So bear with me. So hopefully you can see that that needle is now a one division of that top gauge. So that's for the red gun, green gun, and the blue gun. And you can see that the pots are similar, but, but not identical. So there is some marginal variation there. So once you've set the uh, cutoffs, 
you can then move on to doing an emissions test. So we rotate the function knob to read emissions, which is the next setting. And we can see that the tube is reading good, which is really good news. It's reading somewhere between 13 and 14 on the scale. Sort of slap bang and good. And that's, again, you need to do it for all three guns. So that's on blue, green, red, and you can see they're all pretty much in the same spot. Um, so once you've done your emission test, you can then do a tracking test. So you want to rotate to uh, set color tracking. You can see it's gone back down to nothing. So we've now got the set color tracking gauge. So we need to bring this up and bring it up to where it says the set tracking, which is there. And then, um, let me have a look, bear with me. Tracking test. Rotate to set color tracking position, rotate the tracking knob so that the pointer is on the highest gun reading. The, sorry, so that the, the pointer of the highest gun reading coincides with the set tracking line located. And then observe the other two guns. So I've made some sort of horrible assumption that red is the highest, but we'll, we'll see. So it's a little bit under, so I'll just bring it up a touch. There we go. Green is a little bit over now. Blue is a little bit over. So if I bring it down a touch for blue. There we go, that's bang on. A little bit under for green. A little bit under for red. So it's so marginal, it's unbelievable. So I'm really happy that the colour tracking seems to be good. So that's the tracking test. So then the last test that I can see, other than obviously doing remove shorts and such, is the life test. So, judgment of life expectancy is obtained by observing the warm-up and cool-off behaviour of the cathode uh, to make these observations in the emission position, depress the push button. So we go back to read emissions, and we're going to push the clean balance rejuvenate button, although that's not what it's going to do. And this will interrupt the heater and we're looking to see what the fall off is. So there it is falling off. We would count this in seconds, of course. Now I notice it gets close to zero, but not quite zero. Um, and then if you let go, that would be the warming up procedure now. So that's the red gun. And then we'll repeat that on the other two guns. And what you're looking for is you're looking to make sure that when you count the gauge going down, it seems to be the same amount of seconds. So if we go to green, try it again. So, you know, that's over 11 seconds as such. Um, and if we look at this, it's saying, um, what we're looking for is observe the time it takes for the emission from each gun to fall after the heater voltage is interrupted. If, for instance, two guns maintain full emission for 7 to 10 seconds, and the third gun falls rapidly after 3 to 4, short life can be expected from that gun. But I've done this a few times, and it seems to be that they're all in the same sort of spot. So, I'm really happy with that. So that is how you do all of the testing and the setup. Now what I'm not gonna do is I'm not gonna remove shorts, I'm not gonna clean and balance, and I'm definitely not gonna rejuvenate this tube because as far as I can tell, the tube is in really good condition. It's sort of slap bang in the middle of the good. So I see no reason to do anything more to this. Um, and it's proved that the tube isn't dead. So the reason that this TV isn't turning on must be something electrical in the circuitry, which will be a separate video. So finally, <laughs> I've been able to show you how to set this up, clean it up, show you it working, and um, hopefully we'll see it again in subsequent videos. So any comments, please leave the comments. Uh, please subscribe if you can. Uh, like, subscribe, all that jazz. Thank you for watching. Okay, so um, just 
<laughs> just editing up the video now. It's just under an hour long, so I can't have that. It's got to be longer than an hour. Um, so, as promised earlier on in the video, I promised to upload all the documentation that came with the device. So that's taken a little while amongst all my day job and such. So I've uploaded it to archive.org. The link is in the description of this video. Um, if you do find this stuff informa um, this information useful, please uh, like the video and drop a review and let me know if, if you feel I've missed something. But it, it should all be there. The flyer, the subscription page, the data sheet for the adapter. Um, obviously the main item is the manual. And this took a long time <clears throat> to upload and get right. So I hope you appreciate it. The um, I've uploaded the manual in high res. It's in 600 DPI. And what you can do is it, it's not apparent here, but if you download the PDF, which you could just uh, download the PDF there, or if you go search and type, for example, CRT, it is a fully searchable PDF. I've taken the time to do the OCR on it, so uh, you should be able to search for, for keywords and things like that. So hopefully you find that useful. So I just wanted to say that yes, the documentation is there, and yes, the links are in the description. Okay, the only other thing I wanted to mention before closing off is, um, like I say, I must stress, please look at the description of the video. All of these links that are on the screen now are going to be in that description. Um, there's lots of stuff here that's of great value. I'll go, go through them quickly. I did mention in the video that I wondered if anybody had the data sheets for all the various adapters. It turns out this top link is really useful for that. Um, so if you go to that link, you'll see this page here. It's just searching for a BK Precision CR. And you can see you've got CR10, CR11, CR12. You've got all the PDFs. You can only download a couple per day without registering, but you, you can download them. And it seems to be pretty complete, so they all seem to be there. So that's a really helpful link. Uh, this link here, there's some information on how to potentially make the adapters yourself if you can't source them. So you could use the data sheets and the information there to do that. And you'll need the Molex and the pins. And those two links are for those relevant parts. Uh, that page there I'll, I'll open in a moment. This page is, a, is through the Wayback and um, somebody on one of the arcade forums posted this and there's there's a lot of good information about how to troubleshoot monitors and stuff like that. Uh, that's just for legacy reasons. That's the page where they say that the CRT testers are now discontinued, have been since 2007. This, I think, is a real testament to B&K Precision Corp um, that they still have this up. If we have a quick look at this... This is a 60-odd page guide, and I'm just looking at the, you may remember earlier in the video, I put up the condensed uh, instructions on how the testers work, and I also put up the, the notes on how to read a tube and how to look it up. So they've actually put this up on the website here, and all the information that was in that setup book is on this PDF. And you can see here about the simplifying of numbers, which is quite good. And when you get through the condensed instructions, you then get down to basically the latest and probably last setup book from B&K. And I mean, this is just pages and pages and pages. So, you know, I think it's a, a real, um, you know, accolade to them. that they're, they're hosting this. I think that's, that's really kind of them. So that's there. This page uh, will... We'll get to that next. Why not? Um, so <laughs> this is very interesting and it would take a long time to digest this, but they say the same thing about how the models are and what have you. Um, it explains how the part numbers are kind of come about, how they are assembled and how you can work out what is what in CRT families and the year that the tube was made. That's an 86 tube. That's a 91 tube. Um, and then as you go down through all of this information, it also says what the um, what the, the common neck types are and what they're for. So this one here, which uh, is a CR23 in our land, 
you can see you've got the Nano MS8s, the MS9s, you've got the Wells Gardner K7000, 7500, U2000, U5000. So obviously that's a really key adapter to have if you can get your hands on one. Um, and then we can see here the next one. And we can see again some of the Hendrix monitors, Wells Gardner there. And that's CR24. Um, and then the CR31, which I think seems to be the most common in TVs as well. And you can see that covers the Polos and the Wells Gardner K7000. Um, and then I think the last one, what's the last one? CR25 there. And that covers some of the Nano's, some of the Wells Gardner. So those seem to be the, the key adapters you need. And I think I've got most of them, actually. I think the, the main one I need is the CR31. And I'm going to build, build one myself. So I might do a video on how I do that. So these are very, very useful links. So they'll all be in the description. Uh, this one I'll just touch on very quickly. Um, this is how you can look up a tube. And the information on this is phenomenal. So if you didn't want to use, or if you couldn't find what you wanted on this PDF, just tap the number in here, and you just get everything. You just get the system that the name was made on, what your filament voltages are, what your um, what adapter to use. So you can see here, it's saying it would be the CR6 for this particular monitor. Cause it's black and white, yeah, one of the lower things. Set your G1 to 50 volts, filament to 6.3. Um, I just, you know, is is very very comprehensive. So, hopefully you find those links really helpful. Hopefully you found the video helpful. You know, if you think I've missed anything, let me know. But otherwise, that's it for now. So, thanks for watching and be in touch again soon.